Welcome to our next session at Gala Connected. We're excited to have you with us and have two great sessions for you. We're all expert by now how the chat works, but just wanted to remind you that if you have any questions, please use the, please use the Q and A button. We'll answer them at the end of the session. You are also welcome to chat with the attendees and the panelists. And if you have any difficulties, please use the chat box and the gala uh, team will be with you. And now I have the immense pleasure and honor to introduce to you our first two speakers, Patrick Nunes and Fardad Zabetian. Patrick, is the Director of Global Communications and Design at Rotary International. He leads the team responsible for interpretation, localization, and creation of content that is meaningful, visually relevant, and inspirational to Rotary's global audiences. He also serves on the GALA's Board of Directors. And Fardad is a visionary entrepreneur who has founded and placed two companies among fastest growing businesses in America. In 2012, he was part of the design and rollout of a complete makeover of the UN's meeting facilities, including the General Assembly Hall in New York. He also played a key supporting role as a high-end equipment provider to various iterations of the IMF, World Bank, and several European institutions. In 2017, Fardad founded Kudo, a multilingual web conferencing software platform with a network of nearly 9,000 interpreters. Patrick and Fardad, the audience is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Sabina. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you all here. And um, Fardad and I will walk you through a, a little journey that we, we went on together uh, when considering the end user in terms of interpretation services and what we can do for them. That's right. Um, so it was about uh, March of 2018 and I made not a very smart decision to start driving to Boston to Gallo 2018 uh, because of the snowstorm and got a text message from Amtrak, the train that the train got canceled. So I decided to drive. Apparently Patrick made the same choice and he was also driving to Boston. So this is really the event that uh, I got the opportunity to meet Patrick, uh, Carol, and their team uh, from uh, Rotary. Yeah, that's where it all started. And, and as we met um, at the end of actually the gala in Boston, the conference, we were talking and we were talking about some aspects of where we were at Rotary International. So at Rotary International, we're a global organization and our work at the world headquarters outside of Chicago and Evanston. And we have a, a facility that supports a lot of meetings that we do, similar to the United Nations and some other global organizations. So as Fordad and I were talking, uh, it came you know, down to one pain point that we're having at the time we really needed to find some solutions for some of the facilities that we have in terms of interpretation. And very simply, it always started from one buzzing noise that was happening in our equipment in the boardroom. Our CEO kept complaining. Every meeting that we had, he would complain, what's this white noise? Can somebody please solve this white noise? And as we were talking, Fardad and I, you know, it always started with the, the, the white noise, but then it developed to what's behind that? Where is it coming from and what can we do to solve it from a bigger perspective? So that was one small problem that they became, became a very large project that uh, he and I actually and the team embarked together. That's right. Um, so, he, so we start uh, collaborating further, investigating. Uh, so uh, we, the first thing we wanted to do is really understand the workflow. What, uh, the users do, how they meet, how they collaborate, what are the current challenges. So um, here's a picture of me using my older generation iPhone uh, to take from uh, the executive boardroom at Rotary headquarters in Evanston, uh, Illinois, and uh, really sitting, not sitting, but observing uh, the meeting and the workflow and really understanding what the current challenges. Um, uh, and what are the meeting pro protocols are? What are the things that they need to be in place for successful meeting when you have uh, 
sometimes as many as five languages uh, in these board meetings. Yeah, and it was interesting for us because we were, you know, in our team, in our global communications team, we were used to being the ones called upon to provide interpretation service. So basically we would make sure that we have interpreters available, we were coordinating with the meeting organizers, and then out of, out of a sudden from that white noise, it became about how can we improve the interpretation system of this whole building? So for me personally, it was very interesting because it was the first time we were now pitching an idea to the major stakeholders of an organization about how can we actually turn things around and not only fix the white noise, but really bring this up to the, the, the standards that we needed. And then we were thinking, what, what's, again, what's behind this, right? So how can we make this pitch? How can we convince folks that what we're pitching that requires a lot of investment, a lot of time is important? So we, we needed to understand better of what others had done. So we used some investment uh, funds that we had and we embarked on, on a physical journey to understand how others like big players like the United Nations, the IMF and the World Bank, how were they treating that? So we would be able to build a case to convince stakeholders because it was not just about fixing equipment. It's about what's the value it can bring to different stakeholders. We had our staff, you know, on the, on the staff side, we had our CEO and others. And then, but also we had on the volunteer side, our board of directors. So how can we convince all these people that it's worth making an investment to transform our facilities? And what does it mean? Because truth be told, many, many times, and I know a lot of you can, can relate to this, when it comes to interpreting and interpretation services, many people who don't rely on that to have conversations and conduct their meetings, that's a second thought for them. So how can we have those understand, put themselves in the role of those who truly need to be able to sell this idea? So we're going from a node system that had analog, you know, there was an analog system. That's why the white noise was there. Um, we had the poor quality in broadcast. We also had uh, limited technology for interpreters. So how can we also keep the interpreters in mind and bring the knowledge that we had? We have an in-house team of interpreters. How can we leverage them? And, and how can we also convince them that the facilities that we had were limited by the space, right? We had a certain numbers of booths. So we had to dig study cases of what could what we could use as examples to show how we were missing out at the end user level to convince folks of what we needed. That's right. One of the, uh, Patrick, what I recall, one of the um, objective was being able to add languages in different rooms as the number of languages being uh, requested on some specific meetings was uh, increasing. So being able to, uh, because uh, there is always limitation on real estate and the size of each conference room, being able to combine, add languages, add boots uh, into the meeting spaces. Um, I believe, Rodery, if I recall, uh, there are in the, in the main office, uh, there are about seven, eight conference rooms, auditoriums, divisible spaces, uh, boardroom. And being able to connect these rooms and become a very large rooms that you can share assets, resources, and add languages, that was a key as well. It was, yeah. Here, yeah, here are like um, a few examples that uh, Patrick and his team wanted to do site visits and really look at how the technology is being used in pretty much the, uh, top users of language interpretations in the country or probably globally. Yeah, so eventually we were able um, to, to build a case, right? So we built a case of to go before the board to ask for, for, for approval in terms of funds, of course, and in terms of, of the, the permits and, and everything that we needed, the approvals that we need to go ahead with this project. And it, it was interesting because one of the main aspects, again, really had to boil down to really reach their, their heart. It really had to boil down to how limited participation was. So it was not about, it was not about getting rid of the white noise. It was not about having the, the you know, state-of-the-art equipment that looked so shiny and, and, and pretty, but it was about how can we make 
participation truly relevant, right? It's about the importance of interpreting in, the, in a global setting, because again, many times it falls as a second thought. So we were able, we were able to get that approval and some of the points that we used was again, shifting from analog to digital, right? That was important for us. The high quality of broadcast, the additional functionalities, as for Dad mentioned, languages were limited. So many times when we had board meetings with six different languages at the board for that certain year, we had to turn down interpretation for certain board members because we didn't have the physical booths available in the boardroom. So, and, and at the time we started talking about, ironically enough, we started talking about um, how can we better support remote meetings because that's very limited. This was way before, before the situation that we are today, but we were trying to think ahead. What are the other things that we can add to this to sweet, sweeten the deal and get the approvals that we need? So. Luckily, we were able to convince folks and then it became to the planning phase. That's right. And during the planning phase, of course, it's, it's all about uh, understanding the uh, renovation timeline uh, of the building, where the building is going to be accessible, where rooms going to be accessible, um, all the drawings, engineering, budgeting, and uh, putting a training and uh, commissioning plan in place. Uh, to be able to execute the plan and uh, voila, this is uh, the upgraded uh, board meeting, uh, boardroom uh, back in 2000, late 2018. Uh, That's correct. That was ready to go. And uh, then of course, here the technology is there now is pretty much onboarding the users and that's a whole new challenge that had, that's correct uh, there's a lot of technology that they need to learn and adopt and use and uh, also optimize the technology for the usage right and that was interesting because when we were, were going down this journey and we we're talking about the benefits um, and that was one one thing that we would have done differently was that it was not engaging enough of the end user. We were going from our own perspective, from the perspective of the interpreters, from the knowledge that we had from, from Fardad and his team, but we left out a few components of engaging the end user at that stage. So as, as, as you saw in the picture, everything looked beautiful, shiny, you know, new equipment, we're all excited. We got the technical size that we need, but then the challenges really came. And, and some of these challenges um, were as simple as, you know, our end users not being able to read what was on the screen before them. We used to have these huge TV screens in the middle of the board room. So they were the, our board members and other participants were so used to reading material in that huge TV screen in the boardroom. And we had made a decision from what you can see in the photo to take away that TV screen because everybody had a screen in front of them. So of course we were getting feedback right after implementation of, I can't see, I can't read what's there. It's too small. How can we fix this? How can we change this? And all the investment had already been put in. So again, and the learning curve of the equipment, right? We, we were very familiar with the equipment, but our end user, not necessarily. So we had to create a whole set of onboarding and training materials to make sure people were comfortable with it because of course there was a price tag attached to it. So that, 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 you know, that demand for, okay, what's the return on this investment was very high. So we learned, we learned very quickly that um, not engaging the end user in every single step of this, of this stage uh, was something that we could have done differently. Yeah. Then of course, uh, in 2019, and uh, there were multiple offsite meetings at Rotary that uh, we were supported, but what uh, we start experiencing is really uh, Rotary uh, and the interpretation team uh, really uh, very much forward thinking and start early, um, uh, early stage experimenting uh, cloud-based, remote-based interpretation solutions. And uh, I recall the very first uh, large experience was uh, I believe eight languages for World Polio Day in 2018. And that was uh, for us at CUDA was a, one of the very first uh, uh, experience uh, in this level because we just launched the product in 2018, right? 
And this was um, out of uh, an auditorium in Philadelphia and uh, all the interpreters, they were in Chicago. And uh, so it was all remote interpretation and there were a lot of participation uh, as well uh, from Brazil, from other part of the world. Of course, it was in the evening in a weekday, so we didn't have much participation from Asia, but at least in America, there were quite uh, participation. Um, also, Rotary started using uh, remote for some of the learning and de development and some of the webinars. Um, and of course, these are usually, I would call them tier two meetings, right? Meetings that are um, not much interactive or uh, it's more of a presentation uh, um, and they're important, uh, but Patrick, am I right? Are they like considered tier two or, or am I just making it up? Well, well, in, in a way, yeah. So for us, well, it, it, the level of stress that we have to put these events together, they're a tier one for sure. But, uh, but it's interesting because again, it's just one, it's one aspect of, of broadcasting events, right? It's generally a broadcast out, um, you know, that we just have an audience like we have here right now. There's not much interaction. So we thought that that was the hardest part in, when it came to remote interpreting was, was that kind. But we learned very quickly with COVID that that was not the case. Yeah. And COVID happened. <laughs> so um, to 2020, um, I recall the first thing was cancellation of the meeting in uh, in March, right? That was a major uh, announcement that the meeting was canceled. But of course, um, we experienced the spot on demand uh, from our side, from the uh, platform side. Um, we automatically uh, uh, kind of end up having less time for planning and more urgency, um, not just urgency, I would call it panic for execution, right? Um, and that was um, the biggest uh, uh, drawback since COVID. So also we start using the platform on, again, tier one meetings here, which are really executive CEO board members using a technology. The other thing is that not just Rotary, in uh, every organization, we noticed that there is a lot of IT support that needed for people working from home, especially at very early stage of pandemic during the lockdown. And there was a lot of shortage of delivery uh, of gear and technology to people's home um, because it was just not available on Amazon. Um, the other thing is that, um, there was a lot of unknowns for us on technology side. What is the limitation of uh, our system? How many meetings can we handle? How many people can be on a call? So there's a lot of um, a short time for a lot of learning that we needed to do. Even though we expanded our support team, uh, uh, kind of double up support team within, within two weeks, but still we have a lot of shortage in the support team. So um, the infrastructure for us was not in the place to really go to that spike. So of course you start seeing that you're dropping the ball in some areas. Right, and that happened, right? So for us, it was very interesting because, and, and just to, to put it in context, we had a big convention that was supposed to happen in person in Hawaii. Uh, in June, and we're expecting 35,000 people. And then as COVID happened, we had to make the decision to cancel that event. So a decision was made then that everything was going to be virtual and it was going to be a free event. And we we're expecting more than 60,000 participants. And as that was going on, all our meetings, because we, we're, we're member-based organizations, so we have a lot of committees. So we had a lot of committee meetings that used to happen in person. So then we're, we're going to this tier one of meetings that rely on interaction, on participation, on, on learning technology. So for us, it was very, it was very challenging 
because and, and we came from a, a little bit if i would say we came from a little bit of a chip on our shoulder kind of approach because we were like oh yeah we're we're good we did work for the day we know how to do this now we just have to replicate that and it's a small meeting right what's a small meeting with with 30 people when we had word polo day with thousands of people watching it um and we learned very quickly that was that was not the case so um you know one of uh, in terms of spike for us it also changed a lot so you know just to give you an idea from march to september of 2019 we had 66 meetings that needed interpretation at the same period this year we went from 66 to 166 meetings so we were scrambling we're, we're trying to understand um how to how to deliver service and one of the things that i think happened here uh was that we didn't say no we just said yes we, we can handle this we can move forward with this and as per dad mentioned we learned very quickly that technology was not there um to the to the to the way that we all imagined right it, it was serving served certain purposes but we were we were painting a picture of something that maybe we did we, it was unknown we were not sure if we could hold all the challenges that we had and 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 a lot of it um fell down fell on to you know to to this shift of approach of like what are the key requirements how do we bring it because now we need the it support from the organization but it is busy with everybody working from home so it was it was a it was an interesting situation that uh we we had to to work closely to to solve and and, and move and move on with and we're still learning from it yeah, yeah just to add to that uh, this graph shows number of meetings per week happening, well, happened on Kudo platform from January to May. And you see all of a sudden, uh, we were used to supporting 48 on average multilingual meetings per week, right? Average about eight meetings a, a day. Now, March, April, this became almost uh, 10 times more that's 80 meetings a day on a platform. So as you can see, just this spike uh, really shows a lot of uh, uh, areas, a lot of gaps that we needed to fill in. And also really understanding what we didn't know. For example, um, we never knew that on our request to speak function on Kudo, uh, what is the limit? You know, we had, okay, uh, 10 people requesting. But then we go to this meeting and all of a sudden there is 110 delegates requesting to speak on a UN meeting. So for us to really get into that is like having a, going to a, a premier league and having that uh, product into, uh, into real actions. But uh, because we have uh, just a few more minutes left, I uh, want to just quickly, uh, Patrick, how about we review the lessons learned and we can open the floor for the for the questions, if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah. I think the biggest lessons learned uh, for, for, for me and for our team uh, on the KUDO side is really changing our approach. And I want to really emphasize on this very first uh, item, which is um, the approach of being a yes man. I don't know if you ever watched the movie, The Yes Man, or kind of a saying yes to your clients, to your partners, because you are born to please and support clients, right? And then you realize maybe, and then you find out, no, it's not possible, and completely shift this to saying more no's and then making sure it is possible and then you uh, actually yes. So start with no and maybe and yes. So really this is a big cultural shift that uh, we, I'm, I'm very grateful for Rotary because that has been a, a major cultural shift within our team to approach it this way. So now new requests that we never experiment before we start with no, and then we analyze it. And then we come back, we pop potentially yes. And yes, we might miss some opportunities that we possibly could support, but at the end of the day, we have more successful experiences um, on the platform. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, if I were to take mention one of the lessons learned, the most important, I think, was the change management aspect. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in a, in a, a big sucker for, for change management. And, but everything was moving too quickly. Everything was changing too quickly. We had to, and we missed a few steps that if we, if we had taken maybe a step back in terms of communication, managing expectations in the current circumstances, we could have been in a different situation. But all that we're, we're learning is really gearing us to the future, to what we have ahead of us. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, our story is not happy and sad. Yes, there is, of course, there is a lot of things that we learned and a lot of skills. So... Um, there are a lot of uh, opportunities in the future for hybrid meetings and really we're looking at all of these skills and all of these learnings uh, by uh, really seeing the two, this is 2019 versus 2020, a large uh, gala event and just see the difference. I was just watching a gala video from 2018 that everybody was dancing on the dance floor and comparing with this year. So at, at the end of the day, it's all about the learning and the experiences we have. And we're very much uh, looking forward to what's ahead of us. Yeah, same here. Oh, thank you so much, Fardad and Patrick, for this presentation. This is very impressive. Like really, we had so many comments about uh, the number of, of meetings of people. This is, this is absolutely amazing. So we have a few questions uh, for you, but only two minutes left. Uh, the first one is about uh, your team. So did you have to scale up your team or has the technology done a lot of the heavy lifting for you? Um, for that, you want to go first on that? Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> well, on our side, that was a very important aspect. We, we had to, kept, to keep the same number of folks. So we engaged more uh, freelance interpreters. And that was very crucial for us, right? Interpreters learning new technology. How do we onboard our team? How we engage freelance interpreters actually know the technology? How do we not overwhelm them with learning new platforms every day, which is a new reality for interpreters out there today? So we were able to rely on a great in-house team that we have and also be able to tap on because I think interpreters was gearing up. We're gearing up to, to remote interpretation. So that, that worked out well for us. Oh, that's, that's great. Pardon? Yes, so we have uh, had a, a, a really uh, hyper growth uh, on both technology infrastructure and team. So we, we went from a team of 14, now we are 60 people and we added uh, servers, infrastructures, and also a lot of new features to be able to support, but we're just in the beginning. So there is a lot more to do. Great, I have two more questions and you have one minute. Uh, the first one is maybe shorter, but I will read both of them. Uh, can you describe tier one meetings? And the second, what is your prediction for RSI post-pandemic? <laughs> well, if I were to describe what we were saying, tier one meetings for us are, are meetings that involve full participation. So not just one meeting that's broadcasting out that's just you know one way but meetings that requires a lot of interaction in multiple languages happening sometimes we have you know some of meetings that we have now that have 80 people in the room that want to speak and, and all that so our team went from being just providers of of you know of, of the human side of interpretation to really coordinating helping with technology giving you know support to to in best practice for meetings that the organization wants to have and i think the the future is pretty much was on that slide that we had is it's it's a hybrid mode. That's why we're counting on in-person and, and remote as the, as the best marriage ever possible. Thank you. That's, this is the perfect ending of this session. So thank you so much, Patrick, and for that. This is super, super interesting, very impressive, and so much uh, on time. <laughs>